All right. Well, uh, thank you for coming out. Um, my name is Alan Runyon. I actually didn't know where my place was in, in uh, this, this conference, so I wrote about something that people often ask me about, which is a software product that, that I'm involved in, which is called Clone. So uh, my presentation is talking about Clone, really sort of how it evolved. Uh, and uh, I try to reflect a little bit on the successes and failures of it and, um, and sort of put it in a broader context of what, uh, what maybe I, what other people can learn from it. Uh, and also I try to talk about Python a little bit uh, at a high level. But I would like to see a round of hands a few questions before we get started. How many people speak fluent English? Okay. And how many people have, this is their first Python conference? Thanks. Okay. And how many people do web development? And how many people are doing mostly algorithmic development and uh, not really doing any okay, great. All right. So hopefully the other speakers got a sense of what our audience is. Um, all right. Well, let's uh, let's go on. Um, if someone doesn't mind, what time am I supposed to end? In eight minutes. Germany, 
um, franked out the, 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 the design for it, he made HTML, and we had our first Zoke product about 48 hours after we met. Uh, nowadays, you sort of can just do something called a Python A. <coughs> Uh, I had never met Alex. Uh, we talked for about two years over the internet and then uh, EuroPython uh, in Belgium. I met him in person and we made the first phone release. Uh, and actually it was the first time I had met many of the uh, European Python uh, uh, community. Subsequent things have happened because I met these guys who were very interesting. Uh, we had sprints all around Europe. Uh, the first one being in Bern, Switzerland, I think it was at a university. Uh, the, the another one was in Kassel, uh, in Boldeg, and uh, my favorite of all was in uh, a mountaintop in Shrooms. But the most important part of this was the relationships that I had made and the friendships I made with the people in Europe uh, and the software sort of allowed us to have these sort of spreads of, and, and uh, and, and sort of had quite a bit of fun uh, organizing these. And then I was starting to do work with Clone uh, professionally. I found some uh, Zook loving Brazilians. Uh, the company was called XDG, and there were two developers that uh, I worked with there, Sidney Da Silva and Donelis Trevena. Uh, and uh, we started work what, 2003 or something. Uh, and I came to Thistle, uh, which blew my mind. I had no idea how, uh, how open the government of Brazil was and how popular open source software was because in the United States it's not like that at all. Um, and it was just fantastic. It was, it was quite the, uh, really a, a great experience uh, to sort of you know, meet the people who I had been working with uh, online uh, with, with projects and then seeing sort of how Linux and, and open source was being used uh, in, in South America. Pwn eventually sort of starts evolving. We have uh, a nonprofit that was seeded for money from Computer Associates. We had more releases, lots more sprints. Uh, I was getting older, starting a, a, a company, so I some of the sprints I didn't go to. One of them which I I I, I I probably regret, which was they're sitting on top of a mountain with a, a satellite uplink and, uh, and, and still covered uh, out uh, hacking for a week. Then some very high profile websites started using Clone. Uh, currently today, the CIA and the FBI websites use it. Um, Clone started uh, experimenting with lots of different approaches to content delivery. Being that the cloning system itself does not uh, interact with the end user's browser. Um, and you sort of, if you're following clone, you start seeing people who are trying to push it into the different, uh, in different places. Um, and these three different, uh, two of these different approaches still are, are in, well, still being used today. And then clone shifts to something called the Zoom component architecture. And the Zook component architecture was, or is actually, the sort of only way that I know of that's, that's reasonable to actually share components. Not sharing libraries or, or eggs, but actually having a, a divine API that you can actually share and have interoperability. Um, and, and then so the, the, the clone community sort of jumps on this Zook component architecture and uh, we start actually adopting it and, and start pulling in lots of different new technologies. And we also, unfortunately, removed quite a bit of the functionality that a lot of our users were using. Um, in in Zoopland, you could actually customize things through the web interface, so you didn't actually have that file system access. And that enabled a, uh, a, a much less hardcore developer, um, or sort of a, someone who is dabbling uh, or didn't have to have Python experience to participate inside this process. But you can see sort of, you know, the clone guys are mostly doing fairly sophisticated deployments, uh, starting to use uh, software configuration management and, and being sort of disciplined up front and kind of forcing the community to follow and to get in line. 
And then what happens? We start having user attrition. And that was pretty weird. So we're, we're doing everything exactly how you're supposed to do it. We have, we're, we're, we have a, a, a much better architecture. We're writing you know, better software, loads of tests. Uh, we have it repeatable, but then our users start leaving. And I think that, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go into the reflection a little later, but uh, interestingly enough, I think, from a timeline, I think this is about the same time that Django came along. Um, and so the, the Plone community identifies, well, one of the things that we don't have really well, uh, uh, we, we do not do well, is document the software. Um, and and so we, 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 we sort of start documenting our software, uh, write better tests, a few books come out, and, um, and our user population kind of increases, but it's not nearly what it was uh, about at this time. So why, you know, why, did, why did we go from this sort of project that was doing all this really great stuff and having this huge user community and then sort of stop uh, and sort of, you know, our, our, our new user increase sort of very, very, very slowly goes up. Um, and we don't actually capture a large market of the Python developers or the casual Python developers. So I don't think there's been very much agreement or, 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 or navel gazing thinking about this, but this is my thoughts about it. Um, that I think that we didn't set any expectations of the user. Uh, we didn't tell them what you could do today and what you could do in the future. Uh, we didn't really have very good documentation, and we actually had this really, uh, uh, I won't, I mean, I, I'm sort of the, I would say that it was, it may have come across as it's our way or the highway, right? You either do it the way that we're telling you to do it or you get out. And with a global group of people who you don't have any sort of relationships with, you can't sort of frame the, uh, the reasons why you're doing this, whether it's for their benefit or not, the fact is that it's it's they are having to do a lot more work than they used to have than they were they were used to, and the easiness of it became much much less uh, obvious. <clears throat> so I think we did not frame the reasons why we were uh, moving to a lot of the the technology decisions and. Uh, technology decisions and the, the, the way that we're managing uh, the, the, the component system. And our documentation was poor. Um, I, I understand that documentation is the most boring thing to write, but uh, without documentation and without explaining to someone why you're, uh, you're making the decisions or how you're, you're expecting someone to use the software, I believe that you're just not in a, a very good uh, uh, place to to increase your user base uh, as as you get better, as you get bigger. Um, and we did have a sort of laissez-faire approach to complexity management, which was well, you know, well, you know, we have quite a bit of complexity. We're sort of managing it, but we never actually just refactored ruthlessly to just remove as much complexity as possible. And a lot of the lessons learned from, uh, that I think I, I will, I'll explain to you uh, later on, but a lot of the lessons that uh, had, had not been learned about hiding complexity and managing it with the component architecture. <clears throat> and then, I mean, options are really great for people, but without documentation, right? Without uh, framing why you have decisions, you can give people as many options as, as, they, as they would like, but you can drown them in options, right? I mean, having options is just as bad as not having an opinion about something. Uh, someone has to make a decision, and you have to give them enough, uh, uh, enough data points and enough uh, information for them to make a decision. You have to also talk at the level that they are coming into the project with. So we had way too many options. There were sort of new ways of doing things, old ways of doing things. It wasn't clear what uh, what version would you know would we keep one of them or would we simplify it? Um, and that part, I think that I, mean, I, I think I'm being a little bit too harsh on it, but I believe we did not do uh, as good of a job as we needed. 
And when we're adopting technology, we weren't looking at the value of the technology. We were looking at sort of the, we weren't looking at the value for the users of the technology. We were looking at the value of users as the internal development team needing to do really, really complicated things very quickly. And so when you program for experts who are trying to do really complicated things quickly, that is not necessarily how you make in, uh, uh, people who are coming into the system very efficient, right? I mean, there's, it's, it's just not a, uh, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, but it's, it's not, it's, it's not, you, you can't solve both audiences problems the same way. We were focusing on the, the people who were the inner circle who were, you know, building these really complicated systems and needed all these uh, components and extension points. So, um, so I guess you know the then then let's sort of step back and sort of say, well, what is the people? Who are the people that we we were you know sort of trying to help solve solve problems for? And a lot of that were sort of uh, uh, long time sort of so and Python developers. At this point, we're talking about 2006, 2007. Um, yeah, about 2007. And this is um, a, a, at this point, everyone had been, in the, the core team had been programming for four to six years on Python uh, and had been using, had been doing lots and lots of software deployments for, uh, uh, for, for fairly large organizations. And, um, and I think the, 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 it, it, it is it's sort of important also to, you know, say that while we're satisfying uh, these sort of these these requirements, we were not actually solving the, the requirements that uh, the, interest, the, the, the the people who were new to Python to expand Python's presence, we were not satisfying a lot of those needs, um, and so at that point we were sort of we were just simply did not focus on that, and that actually uh, hurt the project quite a bit. But I would sort of like to sort of step back now and, and sort of, uh, I, hope, I hope you guys have a sense of, you know, there was, there's, there's new groups of people coming into Python, there's sort of the people who have been there, done that, and need to have, need to go faster, further faster. Uh, and I wanted to sort of come step back and, and talk about what Zoop is and, and a little bit about the community, because there's, there's sort of a group thing aspect, I think, to the, the the clone project that actually has gotten resolved, but was a, a needless uh, a, a, a needless sort of trough that we went through, where I believe that if we would have had documentation, we would have seen, uh, we would have seen what we were telling our users explicitly would be right in the documentation. Um, and I believe um, uh, that when you have uh, uh, experts that are talking amongst themselves, it's not necessarily uh, very helpful. And you really need everyone inside of an ecosystem to communicate. Uh, without that communication, it's you can uh, people can sort of get lost in, in their own in their own ideas. Um, so, so clone. Uh, I guess I didn't explain what clone is. I'm assuming everyone is what clone is, but it's a application. You can go to clone.org, um, and if you want, you can. Uh, we have a free hosting. Service where you can go and spin up a clone site. It's called Cloud, P L O U D, dot org. You can click a button and you'll have your clone site and you can go and it and see how it works. But from, from, a, uh, from a community point of view, the clone product or project comes from the Zoop project, uh, which is a, uh, a web based Python system. And I think it's interesting to sort of look at, you know, Look at history and, and say, well, you know, what are we learning from uh, the the successes and failures of, of each of these projects? How can we have done better? And what do we learn from these newer projects that come in? So, really, the Plum community is the Zoop community. I mean, that is sort of how it how it just sort of is. Um, and I think that Zoop is probably the most interesting web petri dish that Python has had. Now, whether or not it, it was happened before because Zoop was the first one, or whether or not it's because uh, the unique technologies, but 
uh, I'll list off a few uh, uh, luminaries in the Zook community and sort of uh, and explain their sort of contributions to the broader uh, Python uh, project or the Python, the Python ecosystem. Jim Fulton, who's going to be talking later on today, with uh, the UDB and something called Build Out. Uh, two things that uh, are fascinating technologies and very, very useful. Um, but, uh, but actually, are the, tech, are the two technologies that need the most framing? Uh, these, these are the technologies that are for experts that make experts go lightning fast. You know, you can actually break the, the, the speed of light, but the problem is that if you don't have enough framing about why you were using these things, you can do as much harm to people as uh, you do good. Philip Beebe, uh, eggs and setup tools, and also invented Whiskey, uh, a gentleness consulting, uh, it came out with Repose, and now the amazing application web framework called Pyramid, which I, if, if I was going to tell anyone about uh, a web framework that I wanted to start today and write web, web technologies, no doubt I would say, if you're not writing a web application, as far as customizing something, you want to use an application, if you're writing a web system yourself, Pyramid is the only one, by far. Um, and I can, and you can ask me questions later on. Uh, Tarek Zarek, uh, he wrote Distribute, which is sort of a, a fork of uh, 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 whiskey, or a, a fork of sub tools, and a part time toss in Alex and Elkin. And so, one of the questions I sort of wrestle with is, you know, so we have all these really smart people, and, uh, and, and, and is, is it the fact that, you know, well, actually, I already said this. <laughs> so we didn't really frame the goals of what we were trying to do to the to the uh, the users, and I believe really that it would have documented, it would have solved all sorts of problems up front. I mean seriously. So here's the rationale, right? Uh, without documentation, the people who come into the project are fairly aimless, right? Uh, in by documenting it, you are explaining to people the frame and how you're how you're communicating them to ID, ideas to them and how to extend the system. And if it sounds completely nutty, right, or that you know it takes a lot of a, a lot of sort of uh, movement to get to an end result, you see it by documenting it, right? When you're an expert, it's sort of just it's inside your head. You just kind of do it. And some of these people are very fast if you've seen them programming. Uh, and you know, uh, I I uh, went to a liberal arts school, so I sort of think like things not necessarily as a, a, a raw sort of programming sense, but I sort of think of documentation as an aspect of critical thinking or critical reading, is that when you learn to write, you, if you're taking any sort of English course, anyone who is, uh, you know, who's giving you some guidance will say, well, uh, oh, I have a paper, I need you to read it, and the first thing that they'll say is, well, you read it to me, right? And by you reading to me, you will actually find most of your problems yourself. It won't actually have, you know, the, you're not looking for, it, it's quite an amazing experience if you've done it, uh, and it's the only way to actually do any sort of editing of a paper with someone who's, uh, that's my experience in college. All right, so uh, another question which I think is interesting, and this is sort of uh, uh, a question about, you know, what was unique about Zoke as a web technology that attracted a community of people that would then become to be these sort of uh, prolific Python guys. Because that is something that we need to continue doing. We need to attract people who, are, who want to contribute and want to actually make Python a better place. And how did that happen? And I think that that's, probably, I don't have the answer for it, but I think that it's probably the most, one of the most interesting questions because you know, while people come into these uh, projects, I mean, for them to use the project and, and have their job done, that's great, right? We all win, they're using Python. But Python moves forward when these people actually take it upon themselves to make the entire ecosystem better, right? They make a library that is, that is invaluable. That is where you know, the, the, true, uh, the true win is for, uh, for Python. So the, the questions about so I think, may have been something as simple as it was in the right time, it was at the right place at the right time, right? It was one of the first web frameworks. Um, but I think that there's something that that's not exactly true about that. Um, because I think if it were just a, there were lots of Python web frameworks when Zoe came around, but most of them were 
sort of just doing the same old thing that you could do in Java or you could do in PHP. So why were people particularly interested in Zoda? And I, and I, um, my, my, I, I think it boils down to, to about two component, two or three components, and I'll only focus on two of them. One is the object database. I think that people who who use object databases, or so 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 use an object database, or uh, AKA NoSQL, started about by uh, '98. Um, and when you're using a, an object database, it is a very empowering for the developer, a very empowering experience. I mean, it's, it is like crack cocaine, right? Uh, and uh, and it's, it, is, it, it really is a, a huge amount of performance win. I mean, when you, when you apply Python, if you feel like you're productive in Python and you apply that to persistence, it's seriously, it's, it's very, very attractive and, 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 and very, it's, it's a very, very good technology. But I think there's another one which is sort of traversal and object publishing. Actually, mm -hmm. I didn't say object publishing. I'll just say traversal. And traversal is another concept that Jim Fulton came up with, and the CODB was kind of similar, but they're distinct. These are distinct problems. They have nothing to do with each other. Uh, and I think it's very important. If there's anything I can tell you guys, traversal and routes is sort of two different ways of handling URLs. Uh, traversal is a very, very valid concept. You can always still do routing, but traversal is very, very con a very key concept to get around your head. Uh, and I think that those two technologies, them, just themselves, actually were probably the reason why uh, Zoe became popular and, and enabled these sort of uh, uh, these these interesting developers to stick around. Me personally. You know, I came for so by far. I came, I came to the Python community for the actual software product. But the reason why I stayed in, in Python and Plum was definitely because of the community of people. And I think that it is short-sighted to, to 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 not think that this is a um, that 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 the, the, the Python ecosystem is something that is only about software. I mean, it is. It is about people, it is about relationships, and it's about uh, working together, not only to, to work at each other's companies or to find a job, but also to make things better and to provide uh, and to contribute back into open source projects. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what this larger question is. Why did these, these types of people come from this project, and how do we, how do we replicate that? Uh, but I, I'm, I'm interested in sort of thinking about it some more. Um, well, I just said most of this. Basically, if we can't get these people to use these, if, 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 if we can't get them from going from the project into Python broader than Python, which means it's sort of our, our most common denominator here, we all suffer. Then look at so Django uh, as sort of gateway drugs, right? I mean, these are experiences that people sit down, they they play with and they they immediately say, "Wow, I really like this." And the reason, I mean, they may think that they like Django, they may think that they like Plum, they may think they like so, but really, what they like is Python, right? Because um, I can promise you, when it comes down to it, it's not it's not Plum or and it's not Django that they like. I mean, it's it's Python. Um, and another thing that that is kind of interesting to think about, which is we have these communities around Django and around Zoe, but can these, can these kinds of Python communities exist inside of the platform as a service model? Uh, I'm unsure about this, and I think that's something that the open source communities have to think about quite heavily. I know Stallman is always beating his chest about it, but I, 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 I just do not see how a community, I mean, I, I shouldn't probably say it because I'm being reported, but I don't know if it's possible for a, a large open source project to build a community around the Black Engine. I'm just unsure about it. I would like to think that it's possible. In fact, how many people you know have used the Black Engine? What do they like to do? Two, three, four, three people. It's pretty cool. I mean, it's free. If you know Django, you can just sort of 
Well, if you just don't bite one, you can just make it work. It's not terribly difficult. Anyway, uh, yeah, the most important thing, we need to understand how the, the open source you know, communities are formed and how, what makes the world go around. Please get involved. And uh, we do have sort of some interesting perceptions of Python, at least in the United States. I'm not sure if it is like that here. So, um, so just sort of categorizing some of the web frameworks. This is my sort of feeling about it, and I'd be more than happy to talk about it. I think the if you take sort of the best of these communities, so for sort of trailblazing, uh, mainly the uh, NoSQL uh, uh, traversal and components uh, and a component model, Django for documentation and simplicity. Uh, I think that that. That the biggest core contribution that Django had was opening everyone's eyes up for documentation and, and having a simple framework. Simple. Um, I think Clone for a very interesting community itself, uh, the culture that came up that that is in Clone, and the actual application, which I think would be quite difficult, if not impossible, to build in any other Python framework. Um, and then I would lastly say that Pyramid, I think, is uh, the web framework that does it right um, from the beginning. I mean, it's it can stay simple or it can it can get uh, quite sophisticated. But I think that uh, that pyramid is is the framework to uh, be looking at nowadays because it has the best of all those worlds. But us as the Python community, we have lots to do. Packaging needs a whole lot of work. I can tell you that from my experience and what I hear, the core developers of Python don't care about packaging. So it really requires everyone to really sort of push this up upstream. I mean, this is going to be a fairly difficult uh, uh, slog and a lot of testing and a lot of, uh, a lot of help is needed. Um, the, the quality of service of PyPy is miserable. I'm not sure who's responsible for it, but it's just not terribly good. So no one uses it, or at least I don't depend on it. Um, so then we have mirrors and all those kinds of things. So there's a lot of work that, that can be done there. There's no longer a Python magazine in the United States, if I remember correctly. That's gone. But that needs to actually, that's quite a low hanging fruit, I think. Um, pushing Python into the wider curriculum in the United States, I think in the last two years, maybe? I think it's two years. MIT introduction, uh, sort of, uh, introduction to computer science is now moved through schema and now it's using Python. And I can tell you locally, my uh, university, Rice, uh, that, that I, I work with is, uh, is using this new schema of the introduction of using Python. So, and there's about 10 other Texas universities that are using Python in their curriculum now. And so, that's just in Texas. I mean, I'm sure that we have probably 120, 150 colleges that are now teaching Python. Uh, and now it's just something that we, I mean, it is taken a foot, right? I mean, it's, it, now it's just a matter of, in, in five years, everyone will have heard of it at least, right? I mean, as far as uh, anyone in computer science, and they probably will have some experience with it. So there is a, a there is definitely a future of more people coming into uh, the, the language. It's just they'll be going through it uh, through a different uh, out, uh, uh, a, a different uh, route, which will be through school. Uh, in, in, in the United States, high schools are another good way of, of, uh, of getting it involved, of, of getting Python uh, practice being put into, uh, into getting, getting uh, Python put into uh, classes. And then there's meetups and sprints and all those kinds of things. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of at the end of my talk, and just wanted to say that the reason why I actually am here, besides to, to see you lovely people, is because I wanted to come down to uh, South America because uh, a dear friend of mine was uh, uh, had an accident and, and died earlier this year. Uh, I worked with him for eight years. Um, he was probably the, he sort of embodied uh, the, the soft, open source software development spirit more than anyone that I can imagine. Um, uh, I mean, I, if, if I can, if I, if, I don't think I, I have the, the, the emotional sort of wherewithal to actually go through it, but 
I can promise that Dornell has made, I don't know what the percentages are, but probably a very, very uh, top 5% uh, uh, he was class in the top 5% of how much money he was making in this country. Uh, he made very good money. Uh, he facilitated Python use around South America. Uh, he was, you know, completed the Python challenge. I mean, the guy was a, a hacker's hacker and was, you know, I think, I, I, I hope that he, that, uh, that, 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 uh, I don't know, well, I'm here to sort of, to, to honor him, but, I hope that you guys, you know, uh, can can stick around inside the Python community because we need more people like our guys. I mean, you know, if you are a hacker and you are sort of someone who's contributing back into the, the community, the broader community, not just the Python, but the entire open source community, it's invaluable uh, what some what one person like Dornellis had accomplished in his life. And uh, I'll always remember him. And that's a picture of his two girls, and Brendan Allen, and the girls in the middle. So, this is the end. Um, stop, talk to me. Uh, I'm interested in all sorts of things, politics, world economy. We'll see if the world economy includes today. Uh, software, you have Jim, Wesley, and Magic. Uh, these guys are rock stars. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a, uh, a developer like those guys, but these guys are going to be hanging around, so you have you should talk to them. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter if you're. I mean, they may not speak fun, and Wesley and Magic can probably speak Spanish. I can't, and Jim can't, uh, or Jim can kind of. Uh, but we will be willing to sort of just talk, and 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 you can ask us any questions. Please talk to us. I mean, that's we don't have anything else to do. Uh, it's either that or we talk to ourselves, and that's not interesting at all. Right now, we talk to these guys for years. Um, and the harder the question you can ask for uh, some of these guys, I'm sure, the better. Um, but actually, I do have one favor to ask of you guys. Um, I am uh, missing my daughter's second birthday uh, coming down to South America. So I would appreciate if everyone would possibly say happy birthday, Sophie. Is that okay? <laughs> I really appreciate that. Let me just back up a little bit. And when I put my hand up, just say, happy birthday, Sophia. Ready? Happy birthday, Sophia. Thank you very much, guys.